Good morning. Today on Spotlight, reopening bars and restaurants in Michigan tomorrow and pushing the throttle on the upcoming political elections in the midst of COVID-19, record unemployment, and race-related protests in the streets. What kind of American backdrop is this? My guest, Justin Winslow, president and CEO of the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association, and Oakland County Treasurer Andy Meisner, a Democratic candidate for Oakland County Executive. It's Sunday, June the 7th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Justin Winslow, thank you so much for joining us today on Spotlight. You're doing okay? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Chuck. I appreciate the opportunity. It is our absolute pleasure. I cannot imagine uh, too many people in Michigan that have been busier than you trying to navigate all of this. Tomorrow is going to be a huge day, uh, June the 8th. Uh, bars and restaurants are opening back up. Simple question, are the majority of your members ready? We polled our members in, in mid-May when we were pushing for that, that June 1st timeline, and then that's what we were asking for. Would you be ready to open if given that opportunity right around June 1st? Mm -hmm. And the response was a little more than two-thirds said they would be ready okay. uh, on June 1st. And so it's, you know, we'll, we'll see how many actually end up being opening, opening their doors. One week is not a real long time to get all your supply chain uh, back in line and working efficiently. Right. The next question is, can you do it safely? Because that's what everybody is concerned about, not just opening back up, but will I be safe to go inside of a restaurant or a hotel or a motel uh, and come out of there and not feel as though I've got COVID? Yeah, I think that's something I'm a little more confident to talk about. The amount of time we have put into working on safety regulations, safety protocols, and educating and training the uh, many, nearly 18,000 locations of restaurants and hotels in the state that they can operate safely. You know, and I think we've noticed from our friends up north who had the chance to open earlier, they've really done a great job of demonstrating the ability to operate safely. And the guests up there have uh, come back maybe faster than you might have expected because they've walked into an environment that they feel safe in nearly immediately. I'd love to take some credit for the association. We put out that roadmap to reopening document, mm -hmm. 26 pages of guidance, which was helpful, I think, to get them all of the things they needed to be able to reopen safely up there. And that set the stage for what we're gonna to see tomorrow. And President Winslow, what should consumers expect when they go into these restaurants? And what is it that you're asking them to do to keep not just themselves, but also the employees that you represent safe? Yeah, it's a couple things. Uh, things are gonna look a little different. Uh, than, than they have in the past. You're obviously going to be greeted by someone with a face covering uh, or a mask of some sort. You're going to be asked to wear one when, mm -hmm. when not dining to promote the safety of guests around you and, and of course the workforce as well. Uh, so that's going to look a little different. You're going to see some signage uh, that, that dictate or that, that delineates some of these things uh, that, that are expected of you. Uh, and you're going to see a, a lot more hand sanitizer everywhere you go, frankly. If someone comes and they say they don't want to wear a face mask, do the establishment have the legal right to be able to turn them away? Yeah, that's a challenge. I mean, it is per the executive order, it is required to be in an enclosed setting that the guests need to be wearing uh, some form of face covering. And so it's a difficult position, frankly, to put a restaurant tour sure, uh, sure. in, and not even necessarily the owner, but the server who might have that first interaction with the individual. Uh, what we're finding and what we saw up north uh, was a lot of uh, restaurants providing some version of them, having disposable face coverings and saying, you know, listen, I'm going to need you to put this on. And if you, and if you don't feel comfortable, we can still offer you curbside uh, carry out or, or some version of delivery to go here for you. Sure. You have a you represent a 40 billion dollar industry when it is super healthy uh, before all this COVID-19 hit. Um, about 600,000 Michiganders working in this industry. That's a lot of people and a lot of bucks. Where do you stand now in terms of the health of the industry? And do you believe you can get back to those numbers and how long might it take? That's the multi-billion dollar question, right? Uh, we know that we have lost well over $3 billion just on the restaurant side, just in the last couple months. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not gonna be made up. Uh, we know that over 350,000 people were laid off that were working in this industry. 
Uh, and we're going to be bringing some of them back over the near future, but that's not going to be a, a snap of the finger and the industry goes back to normal. Uh, I think this industry is resilient and capable of operating efficiently pretty quickly itself, mm -hmm. but it also relies on the disposable income of a broader economy. And I don't know where that's going to be over the next 18 to 24 months. Okay, we need to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll have some more questions that deal with safety, but also about um, how these industries that have been hurt, how they can sort of get back on their feet with the help of your organization. We'll be right back with Justin Winslow. Don't go away. And welcome back to Spotlight. Justin Winslow, a lot of your membership represents small restaurants, small um, maybe motels and even hotels, um, and they can't necessarily do all of the training and everything else because they don't have the deep pockets the way the bigger ones are. How is it that your organization is assisting them, whether it's CDC training, learning what they need to do, and also making sure that you can help them financially stay afloat because so many businesses are not going to come out of this COVID-19, unfortunately. Yeah, that's 100% true. And I think those small independents are, are, are disproportionately going to be affected because they don't have the deep pockets. Those are the ones we're the most focused on right now. And it's two thirds of our membership are the small independent who have one location. That's everything to them, right? So. That is focusing our advocacy, which is to trying to provide as much either tax forbearance and forgiveness, uh, some stimulus dollars at the federal level, uh, trying to actually also advocate, and this just happened last night, uh, thank you to our Michigan senators for helping to pass some flexibility on the what they call the PPP loans Heard to make them that. more relevant to this industry. So that gives uh, them so more time, correct? more time, a uh, better ability to use those dollars at a, at a time that makes sense for them, but also have a better chance at forgiveness where this industry, because it's been forced closed, was more likely than not going to have to repay these loans while the vast majority of other businesses were going to get uh, relief from them, essentially operating as a grant. So I think there's a much better chance that there will not be uh, a loan requirement uh, side of this equation, which is great. I and mean, it's exactly what this industry needs. What do you think will come back quicker, the restaurants and the bars or the hotels, the lodging, or is it, is it pretty much even Steven? It's like you're asking me, which one of my children do I love the most? <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't want to do that and get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's a really good question. I, I, and I, cause I think it'll be segments of each that will come back quicker than other segments within each. You know, I think if you are a hotel, but you operate on big convention style business, those types of meetings are not yet allowed. And it's going to be a slower road back. We know that those hotels thrive with a really active um, uh, public facing community where there's a lot of business travel, et cetera. That's not happening right now. So it'll take a little while, just like some restaurants in locations that are in business dense districts that are choosing like in downtown Detroit, many offices choosing to stay working from home through 2020. It's going to be hard for them to generate the kind of revenue that they used to because business lunches, et cetera, used to present uh, represent such a large portion of the revenue. So, you know, those will take a little longer, whereas, you know, your corner community restaurant might actually be ready to, to, to get back to no, more normal pretty quickly. Uh, I hear that there are probably a decent number of employees that have had to file for unemployment with the unemployment checks, some of them say they're making more now than they were making when they were actually working in the industry. Um, how do you address that issue? What we have found has worked the best is our partnership with the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity uh, at the state, offering something called the work share program, offering the ability to bring back employees at a percentage of where they used to work uh, for anywhere between 40 and 90% of their previous hours. Those employees get to keep their supplemental federal uh, unemployment check uh, which is a huge incentive for them. And now an employee has uh, the incentive to come back knowing that maybe they're going to be able to keep this job long term without sacrificing that, that short term uh, cash infusion. Should people who visit the various Michigan establishments in the hospitality industry, should they be concerned about airflow in these establishments? Or are you really encouraging these places for as much as you can do outside dining and everything else, do it there? if for no other reason to make people psychologically comfortable. 
Yeah, I mean, out, outdoors is the name of the game in, in summer 2020, and everyone's jumping on board. Um, I, I'd like to give credit to uh, Mayor Mike Duggan, who put a really aggressive proposal out there that the Detroit City Council just approved. Uh, you're going to see a lot of creativity in outdoor dining in, in a way that you've never seen, and certainly to a degree that you've never seen before. Uh, but Detroit's been leading the way on that. Uh, Birmingham is another city in Southeast Michigan that's really been at the forefront of this. Uh, and, so, and we're working in legislation at the state level to match what outdoor dining looks like to allow you to have a cocktail and go from one place to another place or walk through that park uh, where you're gonna see a, a few different restaurants open. It's gonna kind of create that incentive to get people back outside and back going to restaurants again. Uh, summertime is a huge time for your industry. Uh, people trying to travel, if it's under normal situations, Pure Michigan has been whacked, uh, and most people in your industry feel as though it has been a tremendous amount of help. Um, what message would you like to send to the legislators in Lansing as well as the general public? That's a good question. I, I mean, we have consistently made the point that Pure Michigan pays for itself several times over, that it is, it is the most respected ad and has drawn visitors and revenue that the state otherwise wouldn't get. People coming from uh, all kinds, all states of, of this union that otherwise aren't understanding or thinking that they should come to Michigan, uh, and frankly, coming from abroad. Some of that kind of travel is not gonna happen in 2020. And we're really going to be pushing for a regional approach, bringing in uh, people from uh, the neighboring states and, and well as encouraging more Michiganders to stay in Michigan this summer. And then we need some funding in the 2021 budget to get us back on our feet. Uh, maybe it's we're not in a position to get back to the 37, $38 million we were at before, but we're gonna need some dollars to kickstart this industry back up. You know that the restaurant has been there for you uh, when you've needed it the most, when uh, for important family gatherings, important uh, gatherings with friends. You want it to be there on the other side. Come back out, do so safely, and we'll be here for you, and we're gonna be here on the other side of this for all of you. All right, Justin Winslow, President and CEO of the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good luck tomorrow. Thank you so much, Jack. All right. And we'll be back on Spotlight in just a second, and we'll sit down with uh, Andy Meisner. He is the treasurer of Oakland County, and he's also a candidate for Oakland County Executive. Stay with us. Treasurer Meisner, uh, with COVID-19, uh, record unemployment, protest in the streets, uh, would it be safe to say that Oakland County, oftentimes we say it's the engine that drives Michigan's economy, uh, has stalled? I think that's fair. Uh, you know, obviously this was an unprecedented uh, global pandemic uh, that required swift action on the part of the governor. Uh, to respond and to stop the spread uh, of this very scary uh, disease. Uh, and that required making some compromises and putting people's health first. Uh, and so, but one of course, one of the effects of that has been to shut down uh, a lot of businesses and it's gonna be critical uh, that we be there to support those businesses uh, as we've been doing through the treasurer's office with assistance applying for grants and loans uh, helping to rebalance the budget with less revenues coming in. Uh, but yeah, we're going to need to do a lot more uh, to regain that status and to be able to provide the economic vitality uh, that the state of Michigan has come to expect from Oakland County. I'm sure this has been a monumental challenge for you and many others. Um, if you had to use your job as treasurer and you've been in that job for, uh, you're in your third term now, and you had to use COVID-19 as sort of a barometer of your leadership, uh, not just in that job, but sort of proof for what you would do if indeed the public decides to elect you to become the next Oakland County Executive. Uh, what would you check off as, these are my greatest accomplishments and this is proof that I could do the even bigger job than being treasurer? Yeah. Well, you know, one thing, Chuck, is that I have experienced leading Oakland County out of a crisis. Uh, I helped to lead us out of the foreclosure crisis and Great Recession. Uh, that gave me some experience and skill set uh, to lead us out, um, and I think that I'm best equipped to do that. In terms of accomplishments, 
I have offered decisive leadership as treasurer. When COVID hit, I closed down the treasurer's office, not waiting on the governor or anybody else, recognizing on my own that there was a threat to public safety for the taxpayers and my staff. I was the first in the state to suspend tax foreclosure for the entire year. And my message was clear. Our number one job right now is to protect our health, to look after our, our kids and our moms and our dads and, and dependents. And I did not want citizens worrying about the roof over their head and having to pay their taxes. And so I didn't need somebody to tell me to do that because of my experience as treasurer, my background as a state representative and as a former congressional aide, uh, and also my legal training, I had the ability to do a quick situation analysis and determine that that was what was needed to meet that moment. We deployed immediately to help families and small businesses getting through the crisis. I mentioned helping businesses apply for grants and loans. We've also helped countless families uh, to right the ship, battle the unemployment insurance system, and those are among some of my signature accomplishments during this crisis. Andy Meisner, what do you say to critics who say, look, why don't you stay in the treasurer's position? You've done a good job there. You know that office. Why do you want to move to the county executive position? It has taken Democrats decades to be able to get uh, that kind of leadership in Oakland County. L. Brooks Patterson uh, was cemented into that seat. Democrats' number one goal in November is to elect the first Democratic county executive in the history of the county. And there's a big difference between the choice of 11 politicians who decide to appoint an interim exec and the voting electorate. And so my answer to the question is that I am the only candidate in the, in the race who has won countywide three times. I've won in a good Democratic year and in a terrible year for Democrats, 2016, I won by my biggest margin, even with Trump. The short answer to that question is that I am the only one who has proven on the job and proven at the polls. And so I give us, I give us Democrats not only the best chance to elect a Democrat versus a point, but to help Democrats up and down the ballot. Uh, we've got a president to elect, we've got a senator to reelect, and we have a lot of great candidates locally. And so that's what I bring and that's why I'm in this race. All right, I need to take a quick pause for the cause. I'll come right back. Just stick where you're at and we'll come right back with some more questions to the treasurer of Oakland County, Andy Meisner. Stay with us. Mr. Treasurer, do you believe that Dave Coulter, the interim County Executive has used COVID-19 to his political advantage during all of this pandemic? Well, I think that there are certainly some indications of that. Uh, there seems to be some pretty heavy uh, activity, uh, but you know, that has not been my focus. You know, what my focus has been, has been on helping us get, to lead us out of this crisis and focusing on a stronger future. Uh, you know, he's gonna do what he's gonna do. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. And what I do is provide innovative leadership that meets the moment. And one thing that I think I'm doing and I'm capable of doing is meeting the enormity of this moment right now, not just from COVID, but also from George Floyd and the huge need for criminal justice reform and tackling police brutality. And the, the Oakland County voters know that I am a fighter for Oakland County. What and that when I had to fight Brooks Patterson on race and transit and protecting Syrian refugees, I was the one that stood up and that that's what I'm going to continue to do as our county executive. What would an Andy Meisner County Executive Administration look like? And I asked that in the backdrop of protests in the streets, as you just said, concerns over our criminal justice system, concern over race and how uh, particularly African-Americans, but not just African-Americans, people of color are represented and are treated in America right now. My administration will look like Oakland County, which is beautiful and diverse, much like the county treasurer's office is beautiful and diverse because I have made a priority 
of hiring women, hiring people of color into important positions. And my office will do that. When I have the stage to talk about and to lead on diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm gonna do it. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Black Lives Matter. I'm not gonna run away uh, from things because I'm putting my finger in the wind. Uh, the administration that I run will be diverse. The county executive has 25 plus appointments to make. Uh, I think maybe one or two of those right now might be uh, uh, people who are uh, minorities. Uh, that's not representative. The county treasurer's office is representative of the county and my administration will not just talk about it. Uh, it's gonna, it's, we're gonna walk the walk uh, and you're gonna see that in uh, the appointments that we make and not only in the way that we restructure the culture of Oakland County, uh, which has been affected by Brooks Patterson and his worldview, we are gonna be leaders so that every resident in Oakland County is leading a better life, free from fear of police brutality. And that's gonna happen by divisive or de decisive leadership that stands up, not when the camera's on talking about George Floyd, but when you have an opportunity to speak to every audience. Uh, you know, we've had Black Lives Matter on our website since last March, uh, not just when a crisis comes up. We have to build out the policy architecture that is gonna make Oakland County competitive. We have to strengthen our entrepreneurial ecosystem and provide business opportunities for women and people of color. And so that's my focus. My focus is on fighting for our future using the same trademark of innovation uh, that I brought to my roles in government. I wrote the state's stem cell research law as a state representative. That was transformational. Uh, as the county treasurer, I've saved 30,000 homes from foreclosure. That was transformational. I'm gonna bring that same style of leadership because I think that that is what the Oakland County voters deserve and not just another politician. Thank you so much for joining us today on Spotlight. Good luck on the campaign trail. Uh, we'll follow you and the other candidates and we'll see what happens in August as the first test. Thank you so much for joining us today on Spotlight and uh, stay healthy. Thank you, Chuck, you as well. Thank you so much. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the Spotlight. Have a great week and please stay safe.